بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلي محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين إمامنا وسيدنا الحجة بن الحسن المهدي أرواح العالمين له الفدا أيها الإخوة الكرام الأخوات الكريمات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters It's a great honor for me to be amongst you this evening as we continue our series to examine the life of the 12 shining stars of Ahlul Bayt, the 12 Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Inshallah, you're all keeping well. Inshallah, you're all safe. You all have been in my prayers. I ask Allah to bless you, to protect you and your families as well. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us through these difficult times and these great afflictions. It's a trial for all of us, but what counts is for us to stay patient, to continue our good deeds, to hold on to our values, to stay close to our families, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely bless us if we do that. So now, my dear brothers and sisters, let's examine in our discussion this evening the life of the fifth Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Al Imam Muhammad Al Baqir, salawatullahi alayhi. Al Imam Al Imam Muhammad Al Baqir, alayhi salam, was born in the year 57 after the Hijrah. Now, when Al Imam Al Baqir was born, his grandfather, Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, was still alive because Al Imam Al Baqir is the son of Al Imam Zain al Abidin, the son of Al Imam Al Hussein. Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam was martyred at Karbala year 61 after the Hijrah. So Al Imam Al Baqir alayhi salam was about three and a half years old when he was present there in Karbala. He went with the caravan of Imam Hussein from Medina to Mecca and then all the way to Karbala. Al Imam Al Baqir salam witnessed the atrocities, the tragedies that took place in the land of Karbala. And this had a lifelong impact on him. Imagine a child not even four years old yet, and this child has to witness the greatest tragedy in human history. He witnessed the massacre of his grandfather. He witnessed the massacre of his uncles, Ali and Al Akbar, even the Radiya, the infant. Al Imam Al Baqir was there in Karbala and he narrates to us some of the incidents that happened in Karbala. The name of Al Imam Al Baqir is Muhammad. And this name was given to him by his grandfather, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He had informed the Ahlul Bayt and even some of his close companions that one of my descendants, his name will be my name. And he will look like me. He will resemble me. So his name is Muhammad. His title is al Baqir. Al-Baqir in Arabic comes from the root word 
which means to split something. When you expound something, when you split something, it is called yabqur. The verb is called such. So al-baqir is the one who splits open something. Why did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi give this title to al-imam al-baqir? Because al-imam al-baqir alayhi salam had a golden, unique opportunity to spread the knowledge of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them. In fact, we find that the University of Ahl al-Bayt, the school of Ahl al-Bayt, becomes crystallized and solidified during the time of Imam al-Baqir. He starts this university in the city of Medina to educate thousands of people and raise a generation of scholars. Previous Imams, they did not really have the freedom and the opportunity to do that. But Al-Imam Al-Baqir found a window to spread the knowledge of the Ahl al-Bayt, to spread the values of the religion of Islam. So he became the foremost teacher of his time. That's why he carries the title Al-Baqir. Because he had the opportunity to split the knowledge, to analyze the knowledge, and to spread it in his community. And therefore, every Muslim today is indebted to the intellectual contributions of Imam Al-Baqir He saved the Muslim Ummah at a time when so many Muslims were misguided Many of them were even treading the path of corruption. You know why? See, when you have the government at the top, when you have the government leaders, the caliphs, and they are at the peak of corruption, what do you expect from the people? It trickles down to the people. When the political leaders are corrupt, you're not setting a good example for the people. Many people also turn out to be corrupt. And that's what happened during the era of Imam al-Baqir because the rulers were from Bani Umayyah. Imam al-Baqir witnessed a number of rulers from the Bani Umayyah. And some of these rulers were extremely corrupt. They had no regard for any values for any sanctity, they would make a joke about God, religion, prayer. Oftentimes, those Umayyad caliphs, just to give you an idea of their corruption, not only would they easily kill, and they would install governors who would kill. They had no regard for human life. They would kill very easily. They would slaughter people. One of the governors whom the Umayyads appointed, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, for instance, was an Umayyad ruler. You know whom he appointed? Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi. Al Hajjaj was a bloodthirsty ruler and governor. He would kill left and right, especially the followers of Ahl al Bayt. Once Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi, he asked about Eid al Adha. You know Eid al Adha? Inshallah, we'll celebrate that in, in about two months. In Eid al-Adha, it's recommended to offer a sacrifice. So he asked, what do Muslims do on Eid al-Adha? Al-Hajjaj was told that Muslims offer a sheep as a sacrifice or other animals like a camel, a cow as a sacrifice, and they give it to the poor. He said, okay, on Eid al-Adha, Bring anyone whose name is Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and slaughter them like a sheep. And he did that actually. So you see, they had no regard for human life. And then on top of that, their moral corruption. They were drunkards. Sometimes they would drink so much, they could not even go and lead the prayer in the mosque. Remember, these people are supposedly caliphs representing the Prophet. Unfortunately, there are some ignorant Muslims today who still consider these people as caliphs of Islam. They would get so drunk, they could not even go and lead salah. 
one of those caliphs, he would tell his female slave, right? He was so drunk, he told her, you go and lead the prayer. You lead the Friday prayer. Or sometimes they would come to the Umayyad Khalifa and they would tell him, it's time for Salah, come and lead the prayer. He says, no, no, I'm having a good time drinking with my girlfriends. This is the Khalifa who's claiming to be sitting in the seat of the Prophet. Do you understand the tragedy that Islam had to go through, my dear brothers and sisters? If it were not for the barakah and the blessings and the light and the teachings of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Islam would have been gone. And Imam al-Baqir in his era, he witnessed these corrupt caliphs. They're so busy with corruption, they had less time to monitor him. So that gave Imam al-Baqir al al some relative freedom in order to teach and establish a university. So through his guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the teachings of Islam. The Muslims had lost their moral compass. They were not educated about religion. They had no conception of the fiqh and the illegal rulings. And Imam al-Baqir beautifully restored that. So now let's examine the life of Imam al-Baqir And Imam al-Baqir is so special, my dear brothers and sisters, such that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sent his salams to Imam al-Baqir. Through which companion? Through his companion Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. Jabir was a great companion of the Prophet and he was loyal to the Ahlul Bayt. He was also the oldest surviving companions of the Prophet. He was about 90 or 93 years old when he passed away. One day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told him, O oh, Jabir, you are going to meet my grandson. His name is my name. His attributes and descriptions are like mine. Give him my salam. Allahu Akbar. The messenger of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sends a special salam to his great grandson, Al-Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salam, his great great grandson. So you know what Jabir would do in Medina? Jabir had trouble with his vision. He couldn't see well. Some narrations say he went blind, but some narrations indicate that he wasn't fully blind. He just struggled with his vision. Jabir would sit in the Masjid of Medina and he would say, where is Al-Baqir? Where is Al-Baqir? I am looking for Al-Baqir. The people thought, that, you know, Haram, Jabir is now uh, becoming old and he is losing uh, his mental state. What is he saying, Al-Baqir, Al-Baqir? Who's Al-Baqir? But Jabir would say, I had heard something from the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet says nothing but the truth. He told me that I will meet Al-Baqir. I'm waiting for him. One day, he sees a young boy moving around him in the alley, maybe playing with children or going somewhere. He sees a young boy. Or one hadith indicates he heard his footsteps. That caught Jabir's attention. Jabir said, who is this boy? He does not walk just like any other boys. The way that he walks reminds me of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Who is this boy? He called on him. Young Al-Imam Al-Baqir, this young boy, he went to Jabir. He told him, yes, uncle, what do you need from me? He told him, who are you? Tell me your lineage, who are you? He told him, I am Muhammad, the son of Ali, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhim salam Jabir is ecstatic. He cannot believe his ears. You are Muhammad, the son of Zayn al-Abideen, the son of Imam Hussein? Yes, I am Muhammad. You are the Baqir. You are the one whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa promised me that I would meet you. Come here. Come here, young boy. Let me kiss you. Let me embrace you. You remind me of your grandfather, Rasulullah. Here's a special salam. Assalamu alayka ya Muhammad al-Baqir. 
This is an amana, I've delivered it to you. Jabir is so happy to meet Al-Imam Al-Baqir and he knew that the Prophet called him Al-Baqir, the one who would spread knowledge. So Jabir knew that Al-Imam Al-Baqir was special in his knowledge. He carried the knowledge of the Prophet So you know what Jabir would do? Imagine he's like almost 90 years old at this time. He's a companion of the Prophet Jabir would come to the house of Al-Imam Al-Baqir and he would tell him, Young boy, teach me. Allahu Akbar. Look at his humbleness. He comes to a young boy and he tells him, teach me. Because Jabir knew who Al-Imam Al-Baqir is. And Al-Imam Al-Baqir also was interested in directly hearing the hadith of the Prophet through Jabir. So Al-Imam Al-Baqir would tell him, Jabir, tell me. Tell me about this hadith. You heard it directly from the Prophet. Tell me how he said it. And they had such a good time. They had such an enjoyable time. And Imam al-Baqir teaching Jabir new knowledge and Jabir would tell Imam al-Baqir about his personal experiences with the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa As for the mother of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, her name was Fatima, the daughter of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. So what's unique about Imam al-Baqir, and this is a great honor for him, is that his paternal grandfather is Imam al Hussein? Imam al Baqir, the son of Zayn al Abidin, the son of Imam Hussein. His maternal grandfather is Imam al Hassan. Imam al Baqir, his mother is Fatima bint al Hassan. So now two of his grandfathers, the paternal grandfather and the maternal grandfather, are Sayyida Shababi Ahl al Jannah. They are the masters of the youth of paradise. Isn't that an honor to have both of your grandfathers be Hassan and Hussein? So he comes from a very pure lineage. And Fatima bint al Hassan was known to be such a great and pure lady. Her father, Al Imam al Hassan, called her as Siddiqa. As Siddiqa is the one who is excessively truthful because she indeed was very pure and she indeed was very, very truthful. So Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, we find that he lived during the Umayyad era. It was a very difficult era. And many of those caliphs, they despised the Ahl al-Bayt. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. You know what Imam al-Baqir even experienced? And this is really sad. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam experienced that it was a policy in the Muslim Ummah on Friday prayers. Those Friday prayer leaders and those puppets who were appointed by the government, by the Umayyads, they had to start their sermon by cursing Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. My dear brothers and sisters, can you imagine what happened to this Ummah? 70 years Imam Ali is cursed on the pulpits. You know who ended this evil tradition? Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was one of the Umayyad rulers. He was not as vicious like those other rulers. He had some decency. He had some justice. He had a teacher who had influenced him. His teacher had told him about the virtues of Imam Ali. And he also had met Al Imam al Baqir. And his encounters with Al Imam al Baqir were actually very effective. For instance, once Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, by the way, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is a descendant of Umar ibn al Khattab. He was an Umayyad ruler. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz once met Al Imam al Baqir and he told him, Give me three pieces of advice. He had heard about Al Imam al Baqir and his amazing knowledge. So he told him, Give me advice. What advice do you have for me? I'm the ruler, I'm the caliph. What advice do you have for me? The Imam told him, I'll give you three pieces of advice. Number one, when you celebrate, when you have a joyous occasion and you want to celebrate, observe halal and haram. Don't do something that which is haram in your celebrations. My dear brothers and sisters, we as Muslims should take this advice of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. 
when we celebrate in our gatherings, are we respecting the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, human beings, when they celebrate, they tend to forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Instead of thanking Allah and saying, Oh Allah, you've given me all the blessings that I have. Let me show more obedience to you. What do most people do? They forget God. In times of celebration, in fact, sometimes people act wild. Here in America, do you know when we have the greatest number of car accidents on the street and just accidents in general? You know when is that? New Year's. Why? Why do you think that is the case? Why is it New Year's out of all days? Isn't a New Year a day people are celebrating? People are happy. They're embracing a New Year. But see, there are people who abuse these celebrations. They go and get so drunk that the next day, there is so much drunk driving out there in the street. Al-Imam Al-Baqir is teaching him a beautiful lesson. When you celebrate, don't do haram. Be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our weddings, my dear brothers and sisters, in our weddings, oftentimes we have a challenge. Many haram things go on in the weddings. Whether it's the mixed dancing between the men and the women, or the haram music that's played. Tayyib, why? You know, they tell you, say it, it's just one night, don't ruin it for us. Let us have fun, enjoy ourselves. Okay, if Allah has given you the blessings to enjoy yourself, why do you want to start your marital life in God's disobedience? You really want the barakah from Allah? Starts with His obedience. Imagine if I've given you everything. I've given you money, power, blessings, even the food at the wedding, the money to book the hall. I am giving you everything. Now you use that to come and disobey me. Isn't that shameful? And Imam al-Baqir teaches us in our celebrations, we should not forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always make sure that you know what is halal and what is haram. Number two, my dear brothers and sisters, the second advice that he gives to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he tells him when you become angry, when you become enraged, Always observe halal and haram as well. Make sure that your rage and your anger does not take you to the disobedience of Allah. How many times have we crossed our boundaries, disobeyed Allah, hurt others in the state of anger? The Imam is not telling him don't get angry. Sometimes you get angry. You have no control over it. You get enraged. But the Imam Ali Salam is teaching us when you get angry, don't say that which is batil, that which is false. Don't lose control and do something that will make you regretful later. That's my second advice. And number three, do not usurp the rights of anyone. You have a family member, it's an inheritance situation. Don't usurp their rights. You know, if you find it strange that I'm mentioning this, my dear brothers and sisters, we live with the people. In all communities, we sometimes see what's happening. And I'm being very honest with you. One common injustice that takes place in our families is that when the father dies, there are brothers and sisters, right? The inheritance is to be divided amongst them. Usually, some of the brothers who are stronger, more manipulative, they may have a you know, more powerful social position, they deny their sisters their right to inheritance. Or they don't give them their full share. No, I helped Baba build the business. I'm taking all of the money. Habibi, you go by God's law. You help your dad build the business? May Allah bless you for that. It doesn't mean that you can deny your sister her right to the inheritance. This is a big, Sin in the eyes of Allah. And Imam al-Baqir says, make sure that you observe the rights of others. Don't take the rights because that is theft. You're stealing the rights. Sometimes you see this between a husband and a wife. The husband denies his wife the dowry. That is theft. 
Or sometimes the wife takes her husband to court and she takes half of his assets. If you did not put this as a contract in your Ket Miktab, you're not allowed to do that. This is a violation of Islamic law. Business partners, a business partner cheating another partner. Al-Imam al-Baqir teaches us, never usurp the rights of others. This right will come back to haunt you in this life and on the day of judgment. Don't think you can get away with it. See, it's these conversations that the Umayyad Caliph, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, had with Al-Imam al-Baqir that, you know, encouraged him not to act like other Khulafa from Bani Umayyah. That's why he was more relatively decent. He was less unjust, we can say. And it was Umar ibn Abdul Aziz that abolished the Sunnah, the tradition of cursing Imam Ali alayhi salam. He said, no, not in my government. Ali ibn Abi Talib should no longer be cursed. And he is the one who effectively ended that. But some of the other caliphs, like Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, no. They were very vicious and very anti Ahl al Bayt. And they would commit acts of injustice every single day of their lives. But Al Imam al Baqir, he always took, took advantage of the opportunity to educate those people around him. So what we find that Al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam in the mosque of Medina, he would, like a beautiful, knowledgeable professor, he would educate the people. The Imam alayhi salam was educated in all sciences, not just Islamic law, but even the natural sciences, astronomy, biology, chemistry, the natural sciences, the religious sciences. And Imam al-Baqir was well versed in all of these sciences. And so he effectively establishes a university in the Masjid of Medina. And the Imam salam educates so many people. Now some of the rulers of his time, they are disturbed by this. Because Imam al-Baqir was gaining popularity the more he was educating people and the more he was spreading the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, the more impact he had, the more popular he became. And that disturbed the caliphs and the governors at the time. Many times, many times they tried to embarrass him through debates. Go and read the debates of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Beautiful debates. But the ruler, his idea was to embarrass Imam al-Baqir. He would bring the top scholars of the time and he would tell them, go and debate Al-Baqir and see if you can embarrass him. See if you can own him. Sometimes they would even bring Christian scholars to debate Al-Imam Al-Baqir al salam. And the Imam was even well versed in the Bible. He would quote verses from the Bible. That's how knowledgeable he was. One day, with the intention of embarrassing of Al-Imam embarrassing al-imam al-baqir alayhi salam one of those scholars asked al-imam al-baqir alayhi salam he told him tell me mata kana rabbuk when was your lord when was your lord that's a question meaning when did he start existing the imam alayhi salam told him qulli mata lam yakun you're asking me when was your Lord? When did he exist? You tell me when wasn't my Lord, I'll tell you when he was. When wasn't he there? Allah is ever present. He's above time and space. Time is a creation by of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Time is relative. It's just the movement of particles. You have movement, physical universe, there is time. Allah is not a physical entity. He's above time. There's no yesterday, today, and tomorrow for Allah. There's no time. Allah is not bound by time. Then he asked him a follow-up question. Tell me, where is your Lord? Where is God? And Imam al-Baqir told him, tell me where he isn't. I'll tell you where he is. What do you mean, where is God? Tell me where he isn't. When Allah's power is everywhere. And you find that beautifully, Imam al-Baqir, 
would debate those people who came there to embarrass him, but he always showed them the quality of his knowledge that he inherited from the Prophet And sometimes, my dear brothers and sisters, they would come with silly questions. Their intent is to embarrass the Imam, and the Imam would answer them. But when you have such a source of knowledge, benefit from him. One day, one of those uh, scholars came to embarrass Al-Imam Al-Baqir He told him, tell me, when was a quarter of humanity wiped out? When a quarter of humanity was killed? When did that happen? Al-Imam Al-Baqir basically said, that's simple, that's easy. At the time of Adam, when Qabil killed Habil. There were only four people at the time. Prophet Adam, his wife Hawa, his two sons, Habil and Qabil, four people. So when Qabil came, killed Habil, Abe, Abel, Cain and Abel, right? When Qabil killed Habil and Habil died, one out of four died. That's a quarter of the population at the time. Yes, it's a silly question that they would ask the Imam السلام, but it shows you how desperate they were to embarrass him, but the Imam always had the knowledge. Another question the same person asked him, tell me about that fast in history, so that you can eat and drink while fasting. The Imam said, yes, simple. That's the fasting of Lady Maryam السلام. She fasted from speech. Inni nadartu lil-Rahmani sawman. I have made a type of fast in which I abstain from talking. I will not talk to anyone. That's why when they asked her, Maryam, who's this baby? Where'd you bring him from? She pointed to him. She did not speak. They told her, how can we talk to a baby? You're referring us to the baby? Then he spoke. Prophet Jesus spoke from the cradle and he says, I am the servant of God. Allah has made me a prophet and he's given me the book. So we find that there were many attempts to organize debates, to embarrass Al-Imam Al-Baqir. But every time we find that the Imam السلام, would shine stronger and stronger and his knowledge would radiate. That's his title. All the knowledge of the prophets, Imam al-Baqir possessed them and he expounded them. He really taught people theology, Islamic law, what it means to be a decent person. He even taught them the importance of working. You know, one day, one of the companions of Imam al-Baqir he says, in a hot summer day, I went outside passing by some fields possibly farm fields. He says, I saw a man in the heat of the sun. You could tell from far, he's sweating under the sun and he's plowing the earth. I said, who is this man running after dunya in this heat? You're so desperate for dunya. You're plowing the earth in this hot weather just so you make some money. Come on. He says, I came closer. I saw, oh, this is Muhammad al-Baqir. This is al-Imam al-Baqir salam. He's working and plowing the field. I told him, Imam, I, I, I'm shocked. You know, you are a man of knowledge and spirituality and I see you working so hard, so hard under the sun. It's, it's like you're running after the dunya. SubhanAllah, some people have a misconstrued understanding of what it means to be religious and a servant of Allah. Al-Imam al-Baqir tells him, look, I am working with my own hands. Is this in the obedience of Allah or am I disobeying Allah? I am earning halal rizq, halal income, halal sustenance. And through this rizq, I protect my honor. I don't become a beggar. I wait for people to come and give me charity. And I have a family. I am protecting their honor. There is nothing more beloved to Allah than to see his servant working hard for a halal income so that you protect yourself and your family and you meet your basic needs. 
See how Imam al-Baqir had to endure the ignorance of some of these people around him? But the Imam was a man of honor. He was not arrogant. He would say, I, the grandson of the Prophet, I go and work, yes. The Imam السلام, would work with his own bare hands. And he was teaching us that it's never aib, it's never shame, it's never a shame to work, my dear brothers and sisters. As long as your work is halal. Yes, if the work is haram, then it is a shame. Because now you're using the abilities that Allah has given you in a negative cause, in a negative path. And Allah will question you, how did you make your money? I'll share with you this interesting anecdote. One day my father went to visit a family in the community. The father of the family the head of the household, he told my father, say it. I want you to talk to my daughter. He told him why. He said the profession that she wants to go into is shameful. It's aib. My dad said, why? What does she do? He told her, say it. She wants to be a vet for dogs, treat dogs, and work with dogs all day long. And come on, yeah. I mean, this is aib, say it. I don't want my, da my daughter to do that. <laughs> My father said, go call her. Let me talk to her. Let me verify what's going on. So she comes. My father tells her, what's the matter? Why is your father complaining? What's the issue here? The girl said to my father, say it. My father considers what I'm doing as shameful to treat dogs and to work with dogs. But he has a liquor store and he sells alcohol. I think you should talk to him before you talk to me. <laughs> Subhanallah. My father looked at the man. He told him, look, she's right. I don't want to offend you, but she's right. What she's doing is not haram. It's not haram to treat dogs. If she wants that to be her for profession. That's her choice. She's not doing anything haram and she's not earning a haram income. But you, in all honesty and fairness, by selling alcohol, you're committing a major sin. So you should feel shameful, not your daughter. SubhanAllah, some people get these equations mixed up. And Imam al-Baqir teaches us work. Islam encourages the spirit of entrepreneurship. entrepreneurship. Be a successful person in your field, whatever your field is. You're a store, store owner, you're a teacher, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're an engineer, you work at a company, whatever you do, excel. But make sure that you don't go into the haram territory and you keep everything halal. So yes, sometimes an Imam al-Baqir would be seen with his blessed hands plowing the field and working. And he would say that this is an act of ibadah. If Allah sees a slave, Working hard in halal, Allah considers that a beautiful act of ibadah. And so this is a beautiful lesson that we learn from Al-Imam al -imam al Baqir salawatullahi alayhi. One of the beautiful contributions of Al-Imam al Baqir alayhi salam is that we find at the time many Muslims would use the Roman coins. You know, at the time, people didn't have paper currency. They would use coins made from gold and silver. Many of these coins, they came from the Roman Empire. And they had the inscription of the Roman Empire. One day, one of those Roman kings wanted to insult the Muslims. And he got, according to this narration, he got into an argument with the caliph. And he threatened the caliph. He threatened the Muslims. He told them, if you don't accept my demands, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to insult your prophets on every coin. Because we are the ones who make the coins, the gold and the silver. So we will write a statement attacking your prophet. The caliph, according to this hadith, is now panicking what is he going to do how is he going to get himself out of this 
So he gathers his aides and he tells them, what should I do? One of them tells him, you know who can help you. You know who has the answer. He said, who? They told him, you know, but you just deny it. That's Muhammad al-Baqir, the grandson of the Prophet. With his knowledge and wisdom, he can get you out of this one. He can get the Muslim Ummah out of this one. Bring him. So they bring Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, according to this report. They show him a lot of respect because now they wanted his wisdom. So the Caliph asked Imam al-Baqir, what do we do? The Roman king is threatening. He's going to insult the Prophet Muhammad by writing a derogatory statement against him on the coins. And these coins are what Muslims primarily use today. How, how, how are we going to live having our currency that we use and the Muslims use carry an insult to our Prophet? And Imam al-Baqir says, I have a way out. He told him what? The Imam says, I'll show you, I'll give you the specifications or recommendations on how to make currency yourself. You as the government, you can make your own currency. And the Imam even showed him the technology of doing it. SubhanAllah, look at the hadith. The Imam gives him a breakdown. This is how much gold you bring. This is how much silver. This is how much copper. Whatever you need to coin it. And the, and the machines that you need to coin the currency. The Imam السلام, told him, you should do that. And then make an announcement that the Roman currency is no longer applicable in the Muslim world. Has no value. You can take it back. Only here will deal with the new currency. And the new currency had the name of Allah and the name of the Prophet Muhammad The Caliph was ecstatic. He thanked Imam al-Baqir for saving the Muslim Ummah from this dilemma. So we find Imam al-Baqir had political awareness, had economic awareness, religious awareness. And truly through his wisdom, through his guidance, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah saved this Ummah. Al Imam al Baqir lived for 57 years. The same age of Al Imam al Hussein salam, when he was martyred at Karbala. And he witnessed so many Umayyad rulers. But this last one of them, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, he was very, very vicious towards Al Imam al Baqir. And he could not stand the popularity that Al Imam al Baqir salam, was getting. Therefore, he commanded his governor to put poison in the food of Imam al-Baqir. And so at age 57, year 114 of the Hijrah, Imam al-Baqir passed away as a shaheed. He went back to his Lord as a shaheed. My dear brothers and sisters, before we begin the Q&A part, I would like to share with you some hadiths from Imam al-Baqir Some beautiful hadiths. One hadith from Imam al-Baqir states, إن الله تبارك وتعالى يبعث يوم القيامة ناسا من قبورهم مشدودة أيديهم إلى أعناقهم The Imam says on the day of judgment there will be people when they're resurrected from their graves as, as they're coming out from their graves their hands will be tied to their necks and the angels will tell them shame on you the people will ask, what did these people do? Why are they in this state? You know what the response is? These people could have helped the poor when they did not. The zakat, the charity, they denied it. Allah gave them their money. They did not belong to them. Allah owns everything. And they denied the right of Allah and the right of the poor. On this day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, those who didn't repent, Allah will humiliate them. My dear brothers and sisters, I know during COVID-19 crisis, many of us, you know, are experiencing this uncertainty, what's going to happen to my future, my job, the economy. My dear brothers and sisters, the best moment to give is in times of certainty. Because that's how you show your true faith. There are many, many people going through financial crises around the world. Some here in the country, some elsewhere. You know many brothers and sisters, my dear brothers and sisters, from other countries who are going through a financial crisis. Help them out. Sponsor orphans. Give to charitable projects. Support religious projects. Ar-Rahman school, other projects. 
It's in times of certainty that you show to Allah, I have faith. Because when everything's going good, my dear brothers and sisters, it's easy to give. I, by the way, I've read articles that many people, even many rich Americans, they've stopped donating during this crisis. A lot of people are still donating to charities, but some people stopped. No, not because they're starving, they're poor. They're just concerned. What's going to happen to the future? You as a Muslim, you believe Allah is there. He'll take care of you. And He is the Razak, He's the sustainer. So have to look on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Show Allah your act of sacrifice. Allah will compensate you. Another beautiful hadith from an Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. He was asked, what is haqqullah? What is the right of Allah on us? The Imam beautifully say, stated, qala haqqullah azza wa jal. You want to do justice to your Lord and observe His right? Say that which you know and that which you don't know, don't say it. My dear brothers and sisters, if people in society observed this golden rule that Imam al-Baqir gives us, we'd live in a much better world. Many of the problems that we have is sometimes people who don't have experience, expertise, knowledge, they insert their opinions and they enforce their opinions. Whether in family issues, family problems, so social problems, community problems. You know something 100%, you're qualified to say it, say it. Otherwise, why say it? And my dear brothers and sisters, I don't want to get political, but we've seen the disaster in this country when you have people in the highest office in the country saying things that they don't know. Every day, every day, the president comes up with something new. Today, yeah, this is a cure for COVID-19, the anti-malaria drug. And you know, there are companies in the U.S., they've ordered millions of this medication. And now after it's not been proven effective, they don't know what to do with it. Millions right now, they've spent millions and they're just stocking it finding no use for it. Or every day someone comes in his cabinet saying something. Or he, the imam says, look, you want to respect God, that which you know, you're an expert on, say it. But you don't know something, don't say it. You're going to have negative consequences on the lives of people. So this is a golden rule that we take from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. In another beautiful hadith, Al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam was asked about this verse, فَلْيَنظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ Let the human being look at his food. He was asked, is there a deeper meaning to this, you know, verse? The Imam alayhi salam said, yes. عِلْمَهُ الَّذِي يَأْخُذُهُ مِمَّنْ يَأْخُذُهُ The knowledge that you take, the information that you take, what's the source? Where are you getting your information from? My dear brothers and sisters, before you eat, don't you inspect your food? Or do you put anything you want in your stomach? No, we inspect it. Especially if you go to a restaurant, you look at the food well. I've seen some people inspecting it. If there's dirt on it, if there's a strand of hair on it, you're not going to throw it. You throw the whole plate in the trash, isn't it so? If something's rotten, will you eat it? The Imam السلام, is teaching us, beware what you put in your brain. Not everything is healthy for the brain, my dear brothers and sisters. There's a lot of things out there in society, on the internet, that pollutes the mind. The Imam says, just like you inspect your food, and you try to put clean food in your stomach, make sure you put clean knowledge and information in your mind. That's a beautiful lesson from Al-Imam Al-Baqir Salawatullahi Alayhi. In another hadith, Al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam states, Man istafada akhan fillah. If you befriend someone for the sake of Allah, one who has good qualities. Ala imanin billah. Wa wafa'in bi ikha'ih. And you want to have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You observe the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Talaban li maradatillah. You don't befriend this person because you want to gain something out of them or take advantage of this person. No, it's purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
فقد استفاد شعاعا من نور الله You are benefiting from one of the spiritual rays of light from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam beautifully here encourages us to choose our friends wisely. Befriend someone for the sake of Allah to benefit from their experience, benefit from their knowledge. But if you make a friendship with someone to take advantage of this person, just to benefit from this person, And then the day that your friend needs you, you abandon them? Then no. You are actually disgracing yourself and your religion and you are going against the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in another beautiful hadith, the Imam alayhi salam states, بِئْسَ الْعَبْدُ يَكُونُ ذَا وَجْهَيْنِ The worst servant, the worst person is the one who has two faces, is a hypocrite. وَذَا لِسَانَيْنِ has two tongues, meaning a hypocrite. يَطْرِي أَخَاهُ فِي اللَّهِ شَاهِدًا When his brother, his brother or sister is in his presence, he is very kind. You see him praising him. وَيَأْكُلُهُ غَائِبًا But in his absence, you find him backbiting, you find him gossiping. This is the worst types of people that the Imam alayhi salam states, in u'tiya hasada, when your brother or your friend gets something, gets some money, gets some uh, blessings, his family is getting bigger, hasada, he becomes jealous of him. My dear brothers and sisters, the best treatment for jealousy is two. One, know that this person whom you're jealous of, who gave him what he has? Who gave her what she has? Allah. You know why jealousy is a type of kufr as the hadith states? It's a type of disbelief. Because it means you have a problem with what God gave to the people. If a person is well off, has a nice family, big family, who gave them that? Allah. Why should that bother you? If you really love God, you should love what God gives to the people. And number two, as hard as it is, as difficult as it is, raise in your hand in dua, raise your hand in dua, and say, oh Allah, that person whom I'm jealous of, Increase their blessings. Pray for them. Can you? Can you manage to pray, to pray for someone whom you're jealous of? It's hard. It's possible, but it's hard. But if you do so, I guarantee you, Allah will heal your heart from jealousy. So my dear brothers and sisters, there is much to explore about the life of Imam al-Baqir. There's so much to explore. The details of his life, many of the events that happened, many of his hadiths. We have hundreds of narrations and teachings from the imam but in our discussion tonight we presented an overview of the life of al-imam al-baqir and the lessons that we can learn from al-imam al-baqir so now with the remaining few minutes inshallah we can address your questions Thank you, Sayyid, for that beautiful lecture. Our first question, of course, just like the Sayyid said, any questions, just put them in the chat box or say that you want to say it and I'll unmute you guys. The first question is, sorry, I have it in front of me. Okay. Is Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq uh, related to Abu Bakr through Um Farwa? And what does this show? Yes, my dear brothers and sisters. Through Um Farwa, Um Farwa is a descendant of Abu Bakr. Inshallah, in our next uh, discussion, when we examine Al Imam al Sadiq, salam, we'll briefly look at his ancestry and tell you exactly who Um Farwa is. Yes. So, through Um Farwa, Al Imam al Sadiq salam, is a descendant of Abu Bakr. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, the fact that Al Imam al Bakr salam, uh, Al Imam al Sadiq salam, has Abu Bakr in his ancestry does not demonstrate that Abu Bakr is necessarily a righteous person. This is just a matter of ancestry. And remember, he's not his direct grandfather. So maternally, if you look at his ancestry, um, Abu Bakr is in his family tree. But paternally, of course, he goes through, you know, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, and he goes back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So yes, that is the case. We do have historical uh, accounts for that. But this does not mean that Imam Sadiq salam approved of what Abu Bakr did. We are critical of some of the policies of Abu Bakr. 
uh, specifically him taking the caliphate from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And having him coming from the ancestry of Abu Bakr is in no way a testimony or a proof that Abu Bakr was necessarily a righteous person. Thank you, Sayyid. Our next question is not uh, regarding the Imam, but it is uh, my grandfather is, was sick and I am wondering if I can pray um, the, salat, the Salats of the day for him on his behalf. So my dear brothers and sisters, if someone is still alive, they have to pray. I cannot pray on behalf of someone who's still living. If someone is ill and they, they, are, they are conscious, like not in a coma, they have to pray. Now you can tell me, say it, my grandfather is ill. How is he going to pray? He prays however he can. If he's sleeping in a bed, he can't move. He prays the way that he is. So if they can position the bed towards the qibla and have it, you know, towards that position at all times, he can pray. If he's sitting, he can pray. In fact, we have hadiths that say the one who's immobile, like he can't even move. You can't even do ruku and sujood. You know, you just blink for ruku and sujood. If, if that's how bad the, the person's situation is. So tell your grandfather, if he's alive, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heal him, that he has to pray. You're not allowed to pray on his behalf. Yes, you can do mustahab acts and gift them to him. Say, oh Allah, I read Quran, I prayed Salat al-Layl, I gave charity. I would like you to gift this reward to my grandfather. You can do that. But to pray the five daily prayers on his behalf, it doesn't count. He has to pray it himself, however he can. We have fiqhi exceptions for people who are in that state. Even people who cannot do wudu, there's a way for them to still do tahara. For instance, tayammu. Um, which is basically with like the oros or dust. Now, if someone's uh, relative or grandfather has passed away and they have missed prayers, then yes. In that case, you can pray on their behalf. Thank you. Our next question is also uh, not... Okay, Salam, are any dogs not nijis? For example, hunting dogs like golden retrievers. So in the religion of Islam, um, fiqhi, in the fiqhi perspective, all dogs are najis. Whether they are domestic pet dogs or they are hunting dogs, they are all najis. So if someone has a hunting dog and they touch that dog, let's say with a wet hand, um, the hand becomes najis. So if they want to pray, they need to wash their hands. So when it comes to the najasa, it does not make a difference whether the dog is a hunting dog or any other type of dog. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, when Islam says that the dog is najis, it doesn't mean that the dog is a bad animal or an evil animal. I think some Muslims ignorantly think so. That's not the case. This is just a fiqhi ruling. That if you touch the dog with a wet hand, you just wash that hand for prayer. That's all. It doesn't mean that the dog is a bad animal, a, an animal that's, that we look down upon. Of course not. In fact, Allah mentions the dog of Ashab al-Kahf, the people of the cave. We don't see the Quran saying, oh, bad dog, you know, this is a bad animal. No, in fact, there are some hadiths that praise the qualities of the dog, such as the, the loyalty of the dog to its master that it's protecting, to its owner that it's protecting. So the dog is not a bad animal, but technically it's najis, meaning if you touch the dog with a moist hand or the dog is wet, you just have to wash that body part for salah. So it does not make a difference what type of dog. All dogs are ninjas. And say, just for clarity, uh, when you just wash your hand, like for example, it's literally like you're washing your hands or is there like a ghusul or something for it? No, no, you just wash it under tap water. So let's say you touch the dog with a wet hand. So basically you pour water on your hand once, like if you're using the tap water just once and that's it. You don't need to do any ghusul, any niya, nothing, nothing. Just wash it as if your hand was dirty. It's as simple as that. Okay, thank you, Sayyid. For our last question for today, it is, what verses from the Quran can you use to prove uh, immat? Or imamat, I'm sorry. What verses from the Holy Quran can we use to prove imamat? So my dear brothers and sisters, if you remember our very, very first session before we started by looking at the life of Imam Ali, we had an entire session about imamat in the Holy Quran 
and even some other aspects of imamah like infallibility. Uh, so, uh, sister, I recommend if you can send the link to that lecture, if you already have it uploaded uh, to, to uh, the person who's asking so they can get the full context of the verse. I'll briefly mention it now. Surat, Nis <clears throat> Surat al nisa verse 69, and also Surat Al-Ma'idah, verse 55. Ma'idah 55 is easy for you to remember. Chapter 5. Verse 55. So 555. Five, five. Allah talks about the wali, the guardians who have authority over us. Allah says in the Holy Quran, in Allah, indeed only Allah is your guardian. He has authority over you. And then the Prophet has authority over you. And then those who believe and they pray and they give zakat in their prayer. We talked about this verse that this was revealed after Imam Ali السلام, gave charity to the beggar who was asking uh, Imam Ali for help when he was in the state of Rukur, the Imam just extended his hand and he gave away his ring. So this verse tells us that the guardians are them, Imam Ali and then those who come after him. Same with verse uh, 69 of Surah An-Nisa, 469. Allah talks about the guardians. Now, the names of the Imams is not mentioned in the Quran explicitly. Their qualities are mentioned. We get their names from the Prophet ﷺ, from Imam Ali, from Imam Hassan and Hussein, and all the Imams. So for an in-depth analysis of verses in the Holy Quran that supports Imamah, inshallah, if you can refer to the very first uh, discussion that we had in our series, right before we talked about Imam Ali السلام, we offered a, a, a lesson on Imamah in the Quran. We examine those verses in detail and we look at the uh, full context. Thank you, Sayyid. And yes, I do want to make an, a little announcement about that. Inshallah, our, all our sessions that we've been having will be uploaded onto YouTube uh, by the beginning of next month. And once I upload all of that, I will be sharing the, uh, the account so everyone can look into that. Our next session will be July 4th. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, to you, Sayyid, as always. May Allah bless you, inshallah. Thank you. It has been my honor to be with you this evening. May Allah bless you all. Illuminate your hearts and minds with the knowledge of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. And may Allah grant us the shafa'a of Imam al-Baqir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.